On the Reliving the War series featured on this YouTube channel, we have just finished up at the 1997 King of the Ring and the next episode of Raw we're gonna check out is the June 9th broadcast, the night after King of the Ring. This episode of Raw took place in Hartford, Connecticut and it became quite an infamous night not because of what happened on TV but what happened behind the scenes. Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, two guys who were having quite a personal rivalry during this time period, ended up having a real backstage fight that had the potential to change the whole Monday Night War when one of the guys asked for his immediate release afterwards. There's a lot to dig into here, I didn't want to include details of the backstage fight in the next episode of Reliving the War because there's way too much to look at, so this video will take a look at Bret and Shawn's relationship around this time period and how things all went wrong, we'll take a look at Brett and Sean's books to get their recollections of the fight, and we'll also discuss how this scuffle could have completely changed the Monday Night War if Vince McMahon allowed Sean to leave afterwards. My original plan was to look at eyewitness accounts of the fight, but honestly, nobody gives great insight. Brett and Sean do a good job of explaining things and every other eyewitness account either toes the company line or they just say it was unnecessary or ridiculous. So we'll be comparing what Brett and Sean said quite a lot in this video. Shawn Michaels defeated Bret Hart at WrestleMania 12 and after the bout, Bret disappeared to try a little acting while also still taking part in some WWF overseas tours. Bret was out of the spotlight and all focus was put on Shawn Michaels. HBK was to lead the new generation during Bret's absence but the hitman would watch from afar and keep tabs on Shawn. He had an interest in how successful or unsuccessful the Heartbreak Kid would be as WWF Champion. When Bret Hart came back to TV, he had no problems at all saying that he didn't like Shawn Michaels. This was a little odd seeing as Bret came back still a babyface but nonetheless, Hart would announce that there was something about HBK that got on his nerves while Shawn was, more or less, still getting on with his job. Right as Bret made his pay per view comeback towards the end of 1996, Shawn lost the WWF Championship to Psycho Sid and it was clear afterwards to everyone watching at home that Sean wasn't looking so healthy. There's a few television tapings where Sean would look wasted and he slurred his words also quite a few times, but Sean's recreational habits were something that Bret Hart never brought up on TV during this whole rivalry, even when Sean would get a little personal. From reading Bret's book and from watching their excellent Rivalries DVD interview, it's been made clear that the plan here all along for Bret vs Sean was to work everyone when it came to what they said on TV. The two had agreed to cut promos where they'd talk a lot of shit about each other and they'd even work the boys in the locker room, making everyone believe that Sean and Bret had a real dislike for each other. And the plan was for both guys to work against each other multiple times after getting all this heat and draw a lot of money. Standard booking 101. But what you have to keep in mind is that according to both Brett and Sean, they had discussions about pushing the envelope and they talked about working everyone. This on-screen hatred didn't just come out of nowhere, it was all planned. Brett would talk about how Sean was an embarrassment as WWF Champion and how Sean didn't carry the title with honour and respect and Sean would say the WWF doesn't belong to Brett and Brett doesn't have the right to tell people how to live their lives. Sean's character, the dancing, the outfits, his decision to pose for Playgirl magazine, just how he carried himself, Brett didn't feel like Sean was a suitable champion and Sean would tell Brett that it's really none of his business what other people do and people have a right to be themselves while speaking openly and freely. That was the very core of this rivalry from a TV perspective, something that gets lost due to how personal things would eventually get. The first real time that things went downhill or we heard reports of things going downhill was at the Thursday Raw Thursday show on February 13th 1997. Sean had won the WWF title back at the Royal Rumble and many people, including Bret Hart, felt that an HBK vs Hitman rematch was going to take place at WrestleMania 13. People disagree here I know, but I too feel that the path both men were on around this time period made it kinda obvious that the WWF were planning the WrestleMania rematch too and, what's more, Brett revealed his planned finish for the match years later. 
On Thursday Raw Thursday, Sean forfeited the WWF Championship saying he had a knee injury and he also, quote, lost his smile. On TV, Brett actually said that he hoped Sean could get healthy again soon and he felt sympathy for HBK, but behind the scenes, Brett felt that Sean just made a perfect excuse not to drop the title back to him and return the favour at WrestleMania. HBK would not compete at Mania, instead the title was contested between Psycho Sid and The Undertaker, while Bret Hart put on the performance of a lifetime against Stone Cold Steve Austin. The hitman turned heel and he reformed the Hart Foundation in the weeks that followed, and Shawn Michaels would stay out of action for another little while. Brett made it clear on TV that he felt Sean's injury wasn't legit. We don't know if this was something Sean and Brett discussed in order to get more heat for their rivalry, but what ended up happening on the May 12th edition of Raw was something that was not discussed, and this particular episode of Raw can maybe be pinpointed as the true beginning of their very real feud. Brett was in a wheelchair. On TV, Brett was kayfabe injured by Steve Austin, but he legitimately got knee surgery. Mounting injuries caused Brett to miss action for around two months, but he'd still come to TV to cut promos. The promo he cut on May 12th was good. He ripped into HBK from his wheelchair while Sean just stood there, listening to everything the hitman had to say. The problem here though was the fact that Brett didn't realise he was talking a little too much, and Raw went off the air without Sean giving any kind of reply, verbally or physically. Brett was supposed to stand up and challenge HBK to attack a guy in a wheelchair, and Sean was going to give him sweet chin music. There'd be a big fight between the Hart Foundation, Sean Michaels, and Steve Austin, but Brett didn't notice how long he was going, and Raw went off the air with HBK standing there taking a lot of abuse and seemingly doing nothing about it. The super kick still happened when the broadcast ended, and it was shown the following week, but Brett going long on TV and not giving Sean a chance to reply would cause some serious problems backstage. Sean wrote in his book, Brett was such a hypocrite. He said it was over, we shook hands, and I thought we'd finally put it all behind us. Brett and I were scheduled to do an interview segment. It was supposed to be a wrestling promo. He talks bad about me, and then I talk bad about him. That's how it works. Well, he went on this tirade and just didn't stop. It was a while before I got my rebuttal in. As I made my way backstage, someone told me that he had gone so long they had to go off the air before I spoke, so the whole time, viewers saw me standing there looking like an idiot. I was furious, he had done it to me for the last time. I was now going to take the gloves off, he had pushed and pushed and pushed me some more. It was like the kids teasing me about my name when I was in elementary school. If you keep pushing me, I'm eventually going to fight back. Bret Hart said, Sean would give me his super kick, toppling me backward out of my wheelchair as the show went off the air, but the fan noise was so loud I couldn't hear my cue. Instead of the show ending with Sean nailing me, we went off the air with me dressing him down. I felt bad about it, but Sean thought I did it on purpose and he was furious. I told him they had the footage of him super kicking me out of my wheelchair, which they could replay all week on Vince's other shows, and they did, over and over. Sean said in his book that Brett going long was the reason why he made the Sunny Days comment the following week. While the Hart Foundation were in the ring, Sean said that Brett had been having some Sunny Days lately, implying that Hart was having an affair with Sunny. Sunny herself said she wasn't with Brett at all. We know at one point she was with Shawn Michaels, and Sunny actually said she was seeing Davy Boy Smith at one time or another. But regardless, Sean's comments carried intent intent to hurt Brett on a personal level. Brett wrote, When I got home, Julie and Stu were upset about the Sonny comment, but it wasn't until Dallas and all his school pals asked me whether I was doing stuff with Sonny that I realised that Sean had hurt my family. At that time, the pro wrestling code of honour was still clear. No man hurts another man's family. Jim Ross phoned me at home to apologise on behalf of the office and to promise that Sean's unprofessional behaviour would be dealt with. I'd heard that line before, this time I felt I had to do something to settle the score. Throughout the week, I brooded about what to do. I wondered about beating the hell out of Sean for real at the pay-per-view, but that could be costly to the company if he got hurt, and I also had to be careful on my knee. I decided to tell Vince that I had to pull out of the pay-per-view because my knee wasn't ready. In regards to the Sunny Days comment, Sean said, 
I cut a televised promo on him and made the comment that he had been seeing Sonny Dez, exposing what I believed was his secret relationship with Tommy. Many in the locker room found it to be very amusing, but Brett didn't speak to me for a couple of weeks. During that time, you could feel the tension in the dressing room. Occasionally, we would be in there together, but we never talked. I wasn't very good at handling it, and being the lightning rod that I was, I openly mocked the mood. Feel the tension in here, I would yell, you can cut the tension with a knife. So the pay-per-view that Brett mentioned. Brett and Sean were scheduled to wrestle at the King of the Ring, but the match was called off due to the personal problems both guys were having with each other. Sean would wrestle Steve Austin instead, while Brett announced his big comeback match at In Your House Canadian Stampede. According to Sean, Brett didn't speak to him at all backstage following the Sunny Days comment, but things would get seriously heated the night after King of the Ring, when Brett tried to speak with Sean before Raw's War went on the air. Sean wrote in his book, I was in my dressing room when he came up to me and said, I just want to say, I cut him off before he could finish. Don't talk to me. You haven't said a word to me for three weeks. If you can't talk to me for three weeks, I don't want to talk to you right now. I don't think Brett was used to people talking to him like that. About five minutes later, I was turning around to get some gear out of my bag and I felt somebody push me from behind. I turned around and Brett asked, what's your fucking problem? You, I yelled. That's how Shawn Michaels remembers it. Here's what Bret Hart had to say about how this fight began. The next day, we were all supposed to be at Raw in Hartford. Shawn was nowhere to be found. I happened to mention to Jim Neidhart that as soon as I saw Shawn, I was going to straighten him out once and for all. I never thought Jim the Anvil Neidhart could be the voice of reason, but he got a worried look on his face and pleaded with me. Please, I just got back here. Don't do anything now. God, Brett, I need this job. Just forget about it. What could I say? I resigned myself to not beating the shit out of Sean. About 6pm, I went into the bathroom to gel my hair before going across the hall to tape interviews. I was surprised to see Sean's reflection go by me in the mirror. I could see he was uptight, so I smiled and casually said, Hey, Sean. He cut me off. Fuck you, you haven't talked to me in over a fucking month, what makes you think I'm going to talk to you now? Even though I had hair gel all over my hands, I was primed to go back to my original plan, but Sean vanished through the doorway past Crush, who was lacing his boots up and heard the whole thing. I set out to find Sean, but he was gone. I paced around the backstage area until Owen, Davey, Jim and Pillman came to find me. I know Sean's watching from somewhere, waiting for me to leave this room, I said. I'll bet you the second I walk out of here, he'll walk in. All his stuff is in here. Watch. I crossed the hall, walked into the interview room, and cracked open the door to peek back out into the hall. Sean strode past me into the dressing room. He was bent over fixing his boots when I marched straight up to him. I pushed him to his feet. You got something to say to me? While Brett does go into more detail, the stories kind of line up with the exception of Sean being a lot more standoffish in Brett's retelling of events. We are now going to switch over to The Observer to see what was written in the dirt sheets in regards to the fight. The Observer broke the news first, I believe, and every other outlet gained information from this report. So let's see what old Dave had to say. Hart wound up getting into Michael's dressing room and the two began arguing. There were eyewitnesses to this which basically said they argued and started fighting and it was rather quickly broken up. Most versions have it that Hart was screaming about how Michael's comments affected his personal life and he crossed the line and that Michael's was a smart ass back. The two went at it with most versions having it that Hart started it but that Michael's was every bit as guilty in precipitating it. It was believed to have been a one-sided short tussle which resulted in a few punches thrown and a large clump of Michael's hair being pulled out of his head to the point it was described that Michael's was given a major bald spot. Michael's face was all puffed up from the punches and he was bleeding from the elbow, apparently from being thrown on the floor. Hart apparently aggravated his recently repaired knee, but none of the injuries were serious. So here's how Bret Hart described the fight. He flicked a weak punch at me and missed. Balancing awkwardly on my good leg, I popped him on the chin, rocking him on his heels. 
He came for me, so I grabbed him by his long mane and pretended I was doing a hammer throw at the Olympics. I was dragging him around the room when a hysterical pad and frantic lawler ran in and jumped on top of me. Unable to pry me off, Pat shouted for the other wrestlers to help, but Davy and Crush had no intention of saving Sean. It was nothing but a scritch fight really, but when we were finally separated, clumps of Sean's precious hair fell from my hands. I blasted him, don't fuck with me or my family, you little fucker. And here's how Sean described his scuffle with the hitman. He tried to punch me, but I peeled back and he missed. He pushed me again and this time I stood up. He swung again and missed. The next thing I knew, he went for a double leg dive. I caught him around the upper body and we went straight back through a piece of panelling. We had each other in front face locks when Pat Patterson and Davy Boy came over and grabbed us. Pat was yelling, come on guys. I let go and Brett yanked a handful of my hair off my head. That hurt like heck, but I didn't retaliate. The fight was over. The Observer reported that Brett got the best of Sean. Jim Cornette said Brett had Sean's number two. And whether you want to believe that or not is up to you. Others who reported on the fight didn't mention who got the better of who, with some saying it was kind of pathetic, with both guys scratching and clawing on the floor while Pat Patterson and Jerry Lawler tumbled around trying to get the fight broken up. Jerry Lawler was apparently in a toilet cubicle dropping a few logs when the fight broke out. Brett did pull out a large clump of Sean's hair though, and Sean interrupted a Vince McMahon meeting to slam his hair on the table and announce his plans to leave the company. Sean said the WWF locker room is now an unsafe working environment and Sean wanted his release so he could join his friends in WCW and the NWO. Jim Cornette said he scooped up the hair and his ex-wife kept it as the ultimate wrestling souvenir. He has no idea where that hair is now though. Both Brett and Sean went home after the fight. Sean took himself home while Vince told Brett to take the night off. Raw had to get rewritten with the main event getting totally changed, but we'll talk about that on Reliving the War. Aldo Montoya apparently brought Sean back to his hotel and according to the dirt sheets, Sean was shouting about leaving and heading to Boston where Nitro was being held. Sean did indeed tell Vince he wanted out of his contract. He wrote in his book he'd been miserable for months and he wanted to be with Nash, Hall and Waltman in WCW. Funnily enough, these three had formed their own group within a group on WCW TV. Hall, Nash and Six were calling themselves the Wolfpack and it's fascinating to think about Sean getting his WWF release and showing up to join these three within the NWO. Vince McMahon refused to give HBK his release though. It was even reported that Michaels asked for his release a month prior and Vince had also refused it then, clearly showing us that Vince wasn't interested at all in letting Sean go to World Championship Wrestling. Sean wrote in his book, Vince sent my lawyer a letter stating that I had violated my contract. Skip responded by writing a letter claiming that WWE had failed to provide a safe working environment. Skip told me that they were trying to blame everything on me, but once he wrote that letter, it would be back in their lap and they would ask me to come back. That's exactly what happened. In a few weeks, we had settled everything and I was back. As far as I know, nothing happened to Brett as a result of the fight. Bret Hart wrote in his book, Vince looked like a jilted lover whose boy toy had up and left him, but he had told me that this had not only been inevitable, but was long overdue, and it was his fault for not dealing with Sean sooner. He told me to take the night off. I felt silly to have to come to blows over something so stupid, but while everything in wrestling was supposed to be bullshit, that bullshit was everything to me. Before Raw was off the air, Vince was hyping the inside story of a backstage brawl between me and Sean for sale to fans on his 900 number. My scuffle with Sean was the talk of the business. Meltzer wrote that I had always been professional, and questioned the reasoning behind Sean's claim that he couldn't trust or work with the Hart Foundation. Jack Lanza told me that Vince had known a real physical confrontation was coming before I did, because Sean had told him that he was going to punch me out as far back as May at the Evansville Raw, but I couldn't tell if Jack was just trying to stir me up. I tried to put it all out of my mind. It was Dave Meltzer in The Observer who broke the news, either that or he phoned the WWF's 900 hotline to get the scoop. 
but the whole newsletter is available online for free if you want to dig into things a little more. But something that doesn't get brought up too often is the money issue. Sean wrote in his book that Vince had once promised him that no one would get paid more than HBK except The Undertaker, and Sean was livid that Brett got paid more than he did during his contract negotiations in the summer of 1996. Sean brought up money during an in-ring promo, saying Brett's only in it for the almighty dollar, and Hart even made a sly comment about Sean's wages during a promo too. We covered all this on Reliving the War, but Brett found it funny that Vince had a million dollar question for Michaels in regards to HBK's comeback match. Brett thought it was funny that it was only a million dollar question. Finances, or poor financial forecasting, was the main reason why Brett ended up leaving in the end, but I bring this up now because Sean comparing his bank account to Brett's is something that isn't talked about too often. HBK did indeed get angry about Brett's contract, he said as much in his book. Sean wouldn't come back to the WWF until the middle of July, and HBK's threats of never working with the Hart Foundation again were quickly squashed. Sean would referee a Brett vs Undertaker title match at SummerSlam, and he had worked with the Hearts, including Brett, throughout the next few months. Had Vince let Sean go, then the formation of DX would never have happened, and you gotta wonder how things would have turned out for Brett if HBK was granted his release. But we all know how highly McMahon thought of the Heartbreak Kid. Sean wasn't going anywhere. In a way, in a shitty way, it was Sean who got the last laugh, but we have all that to look forward to as we continue looking at Raw and Nitro on the Reliving the War series. But that was the story of Brett and Sean's backstage fight, if you can even call it a fight, and you'll now hopefully have a better understanding of why Brett and Sean's relationship was quickly going down the toilet as we check out the Raw from Hartford this week on Reliving the War. Thanks for watching guys, and take care.